When you think of fairies, do you think of tiny women with wings and a magic wand to ward away evil? The fairies of Celtic tradition are more serious creatures, not to be made fun of, not to be taken lightly, and never to be underestimated. They cause illness in cattle and people, and worst of all, they sometimes kidnap a healthy child and leave one of their sickly changelings in its place. It's been traditional in Ireland for centuries to leave out gifts of bread and water for the fairies on All Souls Night. It can be very dangerous not to. This is a story about a woman that lived near a, a raw or a lis, and uh, she forgot the night she had, which was All Souls Night, and she didn't leave the door open, and she left no food or drink on the table for the good people. And the following day, she noticed something wrong with the children. Their features had changed, and they were wicked looking. They weren't drinking, and they weren't eating, and she knew very well that there was something wrong with them, and she thought that maybe the fairy crowd were after playing some tricks on her. The door opened, and in came a man that she didn't know. I'm a tailor going around looking for work. Oh, she said, you are very welcome, and she made a little meal for him. And she said, will you ever look after the children now while I'll be in town because I'll have to collect some tread and cloth because I want to make little garments for the children. Indeed I will, he said. With that, the children jumped out of the cradle and they started doing every kind of mischief around the kitchen. There was one of them up on the table and he pulled out a fiddle and he started playing. The other was dancing around the kitchen going mad and the poor tailor was frightened that something would happen to him. When she came in the yard, they heard her coming and they dived into the cradle again and there wasn't a tittle out of them when she came in. The tailor told what happened and she said, I was in a doubt that was some changelings left instead of my lovely little twins and I have been to the priest now and he's after advising me and you'll have to help me. We'll have to get the cover of the pot and put it into the fire and leave it there until it is red hot and put it down on those children in the cradle. The tailor got the cover of the pot and he put it into the fire. When it was red hot, he caught it with the tongs and he was going towards the cradle. When the two children jumped out of it and flew up the chimney. At the hour of 12 at night, her own two babies were back in the cradle. Well, thanks be to God, says she, and she clasped the two children to her breast, and she got the bottle, and herself and the tailor, they had drank health for the rest of the night. But it's not only children that are in danger. Many a man and woman have been drawn away by the enchanting music that drifts on the night air and some have found that dancing with the fairies is a very dangerous thing to do. In the fairy other world, time stands still. Two shepherds of Llanbadar and Fynydd, who had been friends since boyhood, were walking down of the mountain one evening towards their homes. Suddenly, they heard sounds of music and laughter carrying on the wind from somewhere nearby.
Let's join the dancing, said Dick. But as the sun was setting fast, his friend, who was newly married, insisted he should get on home to his wife. Dick, on the other hand, was single. And after assuring his friend that he would soon catch him up, he turned into the field and headed up the hill towards the music. But he didn't catch up. He didn't come home that night, and there was no sign of him the next day either. As days passed, rumours began that Dick was dead, murdered, and the main suspect was his best friend. As the days became weeks and the weeks became months, and Dick had still failed to appear, his friend was arrested and cast into jail until Dick's body could be found. His young wife was at her wit's end. Fearing that she might soon be widowed, she went to Castell Blythe, where an old man, renowned for his knowledge of fairies, lived alone. When she told him how Dick had disappeared after hearing music on the hill, he nodded sagely and told her what they must do. That evening, a year and a day exactly since Dick first disappeared, the old man accompanied her up the hill to where Dick had last been seen. Music and laughter could be heard on the breeze and as they climbed the final rise, they saw Dick dancing hand in hand in a circle of little people. The young woman clasped the old man firmly around his waist as he reached into the fairy ring. He grabbed Dick as he came whirling past and sent him tumbling down the bank. Dick laughed as the young woman berated him for his foolishness, which had almost sent her husband to the gallows. That can't be true, he said. It's not five minutes since we parted. Look at the sky, it's still light. And however much they questioned him, he insisted he'd only been dancing for five minutes. In Scotland, and Slua, or the host, used their fairy powers to freeze time so that they could carry people great distances in the twinkling of an eye. The belief was that Anslua were the souls of unbaptized children and that they carried people to the deathbeds of their loved ones. There was a man from South Uist who was known to be lifted by the host or the Sluag. And he emigrated to Canada, and he there married a Canadian woman. And she used to say to him, Where on earth are you going? You're away half the night. So he explained about the slug and how they lifted him and took him all over the place. Anyway, one night, he was away all night long, and when he came back in the morning, he was looking tired and dejected. Where on earth have you been, said his wife. The slug lifted me, he said, and they took me all the way back to South Uist. And I was outside my mother's house, looking in the window. And I could see her in the bed, and the priest with her, reading the last rites to her. And they wouldn't let me go into the house, he said, but they let me stand at the window until she died, and then they brought me back over here. Well, his wife was a bit alarmed by this story, so she went down to her own local priest in Canada, and she told him what her husband had said. Just you leave that with me, said the priest. And he wrote a letter over to South Uist, to the man who ran the post office, explaining about the story. And several weeks later, confirmation came through. The man's mother had died at the time, he said, and on the night, he said.
Often in these stories, some implement made of iron is enough to drive away the fairies. But it's not always a conflict between them and us. In Wales, there are stories about humans marrying fairies, like the story of Llyn of Anne Vach. Once there was a farmer's son from Blind Sow there who was grazing his sheep up by Llynavan Vach in the Carmarthenshire Hills when he saw a beautiful young woman sitting on the surface of the water. Although she was obviously of the fairies, he fell head over heels in love with her and eventually persuaded her to marry him. She came with an impressive dowry, a great herd of the finest cattle, but there was one condition. Should she receive just three unwarranted blows from her new husband, their marriage would be over. He agreed to this immediately, and they lived very happily together on a farm called Escar Lleithdi near Mithvai. She bore him three sons, but one day, when they'd been invited to attend a christening in a nearby church, the wife complained that it was too far for her to walk. Well, go and saddle the horse then, laughed her husband, tapping her playfully on the arm. And that was the first unwarranted blow. Another time, they had both gone to a wedding. When the wife began to weep, several people turned round to stare in astonishment at her, and her husband dug her in the ribs with his elbow. Why are you crying? We're at a wedding. I'm crying because I can see how much grief lies ahead of these newlyweds. And that was the second unwarranted blow I've had from you. And then one day, the two of them were at a funeral. And this time she began to laugh. Her husband tried to quieten her with another dig of the elbow. Show a bit of respect, woman. But I was happy, she replied because the deceased had left all his mortal troubles behind him. And I'm afraid that I must leave all of you behind me now, because that was the third unwarranted blow I've had from you. Our marriage is over. She struck out immediately for the lake, calling her cattle to follow. Lastly, she called her oxen and they went straight into the lake too, drawing the plough after them, leaving a long furrow cut into the mountain which is still visible to this day. The lady of the lake reappeared to her sons a few times after that, in order to teach them how to cure all kinds of afflictions. And that's how the famous doctors of Madhavai got their strange powers. But that's another story. The Welsh fairies are often quite benign in their dealings with mortals. In Ireland, they are far more threatening. But the threat is often a way of keeping the social order, as in the story of Taig O'Kane. When Taig makes a girl pregnant out of wedlock, the fairy set him a task which must be completed or he will be lost for all eternity. A rich man's son, Taig O'Kane, oh, a right wastrel and spoilt boy, squandered his father's gold on wine, women and cards. That was all right till word reached his father that the son had dishonoured a local girl. 
and he turned cold with anger. He gave the son an ultimatum. Marry the girl or he would disinherit him and he wanted his answer next day. Tag wandered out into the night to mull it over. He was troubled because he knew his father wouldn't bend once he'd made up his mind. It must have been about midnight. Tag was lost in thought. When he heard the sound of voices and tramping and something heavy been dragged along the lonely road. He turned and his blood ran cold. A corpse was thrown at his feet. A voice ordered him to lift up the corpse, but he tried to flee and he was tripped up. And when he was stretched on the ground, the corpse was lowered onto his back. He rose, trying to shake it off, but the terrible arms of the corpse tightened round his throat. The voice laughed. If he didn't get the corpse buried by sunrise, he was done for. Terrified out of his mind, Tag stumbled along the road. The fairy folk screeching like seagulls at him. When he reached Temple Jamish, the horrid, cold lips of the corpse moved in his ear and instructed him. He lit a candle and started digging, and the grave was nearly ready when the shovel sliced into the flesh of another corpse, and that man rose up and yelled at him to get out of the place. The hair stood on Tag's head like the bristles on a pig. He was covered in sweat, and his bones were shaking. He had dreadful experiences in other burial grounds before he reached Kilvrija. And just as the sky was reddening and he was frantic, he saw a newly dug grave. He looked in and there was an empty coffin in it. At that, the corpse that had clung to him for the last seven hours loosened its grip and slithered with a thud into the coffin and Tag fell to the ground clawed the soil in on top of the coffin. And gave thanks to God for his deliverance. He left Kilvrija as the sun was rising and made his way home. He told nobody his story except his father. And it wasn't long before he married the local girl and gone were his drunken gambling days. And all I can wish for is that we might be as happy as Tag was from that day out. Many people believed that the fairies lived under the earth. So it's not surprising that miners often claimed they could hear them at work underground. They were called knockers. They were never seen but they were often heard, and the miners believed that if they followed the sound, they'd find the richest seams, but the sound sometimes had another meaning. This story, told by ex-collier Andrew Allen, was recorded in 1969 for the Sound Archive of the Welsh Folk Museum. It shows that the belief in the sinister powers of the knockers has survived into recent times. I heard my grandfather, on my mother's side, say that when he was working in Morva Pit in Taibach, there were some men there who swore that they could hear work going on ahead of them. The sound of people working way ahead of them. And they knew that it was impossible because Morva ran out under the sea 
so there couldn't be any other workings nearby. Because they were so insistent, and obviously worried, the pit official asked my grandfather, who was a maintenance man, to go underground with him the following Sunday to see if they could hear anything. They went through the whole mine, heard nothing. But, he told me, the ones who'd heard the noise all died in a pit explosion. My grandfather survived the blast. From the cradle to the grave, our every move is shadowed by these beings not quite of this world. But do people still believe in them? As the Welsh poet T.H. Parry Williams once said, I don't believe in fairies, but they exist. <laughs> 